Good morning and welcome to worship here at First Baptist. While you're gathering right now for worship, I am headed back to the hotel after a day at Petra in the nation of Jordan. It's a great adventure and we're halfway through. I'll be back home next Sunday to join you in worship. Uh, Gabe is preaching today. Gabe Close is our minister of youth and young adults, and I know that he will be a blessing to you. Reminder to you, if you're interested in singing with the choir for Easter and Tenebrae, their lunch and rehearsal is today, right after the service. It is not too late to stay. If you can't stay today but want to be a part, talk to Leslie and she'll try to catch you up. Reminder, next weekend is Time Change Sunday. You're going to push your clock forward an hour. Remember to spring forward next weekend. Also, coming up in just a few weeks is our Trivia Night competition. We need you to sign up to come. Tickets are $15, and there is a sign-up table right outside the sanctuary here in the main foyer. But also, we're still needing some baskets for the silent auction. We'd like those baskets to have a value of about $100, but the sky is the limit. Whatever kind of theme you want to put together, we'll take it. See Ashley LaFleur or Becky Land today, and they'll help you uh, get signed up for that auction basket. It's time to go into worship. So now let's take a few moments and clear our minds and our thoughts and Invite the Holy Spirit to come and lead us into worship. I'll see you next week. Good morning. So that uh, recorded message from our pastor was recorded about a week and a half ago, and since then there's been a little change in the schedule. So um, next Sunday is the Tenebrae rehearsal after church. We changed that uh, after that was done. And so if you'd like to join us for Tenebrae, uh, we'd love to have you. So rehearsal it will be next Sunday after church. We'll have a lunch of different kinds of salads and in rehearsal until 2.30. Also, did you notice this morning that we don't have a blue tarp on the roof anymore? Yay! <laughs> we got a new roof this weekend, and they worked uh, Friday all day, and Saturday they started off with snow on the roof, but uh, finished it up last night. And um, uh, it's, I just want to thank Randy Minnick for, he stayed here all day on Friday and all day on Saturday working with them, and uh, we appreciate Randy and all he does for our church. I think he's out doing security this morning, but um, grateful to have a new roof. Well, 
Dennis, Dennis, were you here too? I didn't see Dennis, but Dennis was here too, I guess. <laughs> Great. I'm going to read a scripture from um, Psalm 103. <clears throat> for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. Let's join together and sing as we celebrate the love of our Heavenly Father.
Would you pray with me? From everlasting to everlasting, your love is with us, O Lord. What a wonderful promise. Hear our praises this morning, Lord, as we sing to you, and we ask that you would be magnified. We love you, Father, and are so thankful that you have called us to be your children and have led us to this place this morning to join together in worship. Bless our time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. While you're standing, I'm going to invite all of our children to come down the front to meet Miss Susan for the children's sermon. If you'll take a moment to greet those right around you and then join us in singing, I will sing the wondrous story. you're going to hear the scripture reading from Matthew chapter 8 this morning. The brother Gabe is going to be talking about. But just a brief introduction to that. This is a great story of a Roman soldier who had an amazing faith. And his recognition of Jesus' power and authority for a Roman soldier was really amazing. And in fact, the Bible says that Jesus himself was amazed that this Roman soldier had such great faith in what he believed and knew that Jesus could do. Now, did you know that Jesus was known for breaking the rules? Hmm. Did Jesus ever sin? No. But listen to this. Jesus was a rule breaker in who he became friends with and in whom he would talk to, and in who he would heal and visit with. Did you know that? You see, Jesus was known for loving the people who no one else would really love. He was known for healing people whom nobody else could help or who nobody else wanted to be around. And there's tons of stories in the Bible about doing that. And so while this is a story of the Roman soldier's great faith and his belief in what Jesus could do for one of his servants, this is also a great story about another time in which Jesus loved someone and was willing to listen to their stories that maybe maybe no one else would. Because you see, he was a Roman soldier. Well, Jesus was a Jew. And then many times... Those two never would have gotten together or hung out together 
or listen to the other stories or any of those kinds of things. So Jesus was the rule breaker in the fact that he was willing to love everyone. And this Roman soldier story is just another example of that. I think this story uh, makes me ask myself the question, am I willing to be bold like Jesus was bold in loving other people who might be different than me? Maybe it's the way they look. Maybe it's the way they act. Maybe it's their skin color or how much money they have. Maybe it's the fact that nobody else wants to hang around with them. But Jesus taught us all throughout his ministry that we are to love everyone. And Jesus set the example of how we're to do that, you know? He would listen to their stories. He would care about them, and he would pray for them. He would heal them, and he would love them. And you know what? In the end, they would become friends. And that's what Jesus is asking us to do, I think, as well. And I think this story helps us to think about those things. You listen to Brother Gabe in a few minutes and see what he says about this story and about the Roman soldier and about Jesus and about his great faith. Okay? Will you pray with me? Father, this morning we come and we thank you for this story of the Roman soldier who had such an amazing faith. Father, help us to have that same kind of faith. But, Father, help us to also think about, are we bold like Jesus was bold? Are we willing to love others who are different than us so that at some point we might be able to share with them the good news and the love that you have for them? Father, bless our time just now and be with Brother Gabe as we listen to the message that he has for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Reading from the 8th chapter of Matthew. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? And the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes, and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, 
I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Sharing a word of testimony about what the Lord has done for us is one of the great ways about uh, being able to share our faith to those around us. Our story hymn this morning is Share His Love. So let's stand together as we sing. our deacons to come forward this morning to receive our offering. The offering is an important part of our worship experience as we um, give back a portion to God of what he has blessed us with and we're so grateful um, to be able to have the opportunity to give back to God. Deacon Gary Millsap will lead us in our offertory prayer. Will you pray with me? Father, we're so grateful for your many blessings you send our way. In fact, you've provide more than we need. You provide more than we need so that we can participate in ministries to be your hands and feet in this place in this time. We're so grateful for this blessing you send our way and for the abounding grace you send our way such that in all things at all times having more than we need we may abound in every good work through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
We come to our prayer time today. We have several people in our church that we need to pray for. So if any of you have any others uh, close to your heart, you want to raise your hand for those, and we'll pray for those. Also, I want to mention my brother-in-law, Gilbert Smith, had successful kidney removal surgery this week, and he went home. So we pray for his recovery. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we're thankful for this day and for every day that you give us and for the sunshine and the warmth that it brings. Thank you for this church family, for each one here, and what they mean to this church, what they mean to you, what they mean to me personally, for all the relationships that we have with each other. Thank you for the love that you give us, and for your grace and your mercy. And Father, these that we've mentioned already this morning, we just lift each one up to you. You tell us in your word that we're to pray without ceasing and that we have not because we ask not. So as one voice today and as our church family, we come to you asking. We ask for healing for those that are facing surgery and those that are recovering. We ask that you would be with each one, that they would feel your presence, feel your love and your grace and your mercy. And we just pray as a church family, not only today, but in the days and weeks ahead, that you would lift each one of us up, that you would anoint us, that you would bless us and give us what we need to be your children, to be your disciples and your followers. Anoint us, put your arms around us, let us feel your presence. Let us feel your spirit. So we bring our request to you, Father, because we know that you can do all things. And we do ask for healing, but we also ask for comfort and peace. And we pray for those around the world that are affected by the coronavirus. We as a nation still do not understand the ramifications of this and what it might mean once it hits our shore. So, Father, we just pray that you would intervene and that you would bring healing to those that are affected and that our leaders would make the right decisions to protect us. So, Father, we come to you and we pray as one voice as you taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. <coughs> Jesus with the Lord. 
Thank you, choir, and thank you, Leslie. Um, and I know uh, Leslie mentioned a few moments ago, but um, thank you to our church committees for uh, Dennis Boyd, uh, Randy Minnick, and so many others who helped get the process started and uh, the roof on over these last few months. And hopefully very soon you balcony dwellers will be back up in your space. Um, before we begin this morning, if you will please pray with me. Holy God, we thank you for this church and this time. We thank you for your presence already uh, being active in this place. I ask that you will make my words, your words in this time, that we will, uh, as a congregation, explore uh, what it is to have faith together and what it is to share faith together. In your name, amen. That would be my child. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> nice to know you're here, Micah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, and his grandparents just found out I was preaching. They heard he was coming, and so they came today and uh, just, uh, oh, we're, yeah. I'm kidding. They knew I was preaching. Um, so as we begin this morning, if you've been with us the last seven to eight weeks, um, Dr. Cobbin has discussed uh, seven core church values and who we are as a church. And several weeks ago, uh, value number four was sharing the good news. And he talked about how is it we share the good news. And I want to continue that conversation a little bit today, not because uh, the pastor's out and I want to uh, correct what he said, uh, not at all. Uh, he mentioned that this would be kind of an ongoing discussion for us this year. And uh, he, over the last several weeks, has asked uh, Susan and myself to meet with him and uh, kind of talk about how is it we share our faith as a congregation in 2020, and um, what does that mean for our children? What does that mean for our youth, our young adults, our adults? And we pretty quickly uh, figured out that there's a lot of information about sharing faith, and there are many, many things that have been written over the years, and as we begin reading books and, and talking about our own, uh, you know, experiences growing up, sharing faith in the church, we uh, began to find that, uh, you know, things in 2020 and the language uh, we use in the past may not always work where we are now. Uh, not that our faith has changed, not that God has changed, not uh, that we need to rearrange everything, but sometimes we need to go back and look and say, how do we share faith in this day and age? And if you were like me, um, sharing your faith sometimes can be difficult, maybe even confusing. Uh, as a self-professed introvert, it can be intimidating. Uh, what do we say when uh, in a culture that increasingly is not growing up in church? And uh, w what can we say to people that have heard a little bit of everything and can find out all kinds of things about faith from the news and the Internet? And so uh, I want to submit to you today that uh, sharing our faith maybe can be a little more organic. Uh, there are plenty of prescribed things and lists. If you just do these five things in sharing your faith, everything will work out perfectly. And just check the boxes and then it'll all work out. And maybe sharing our faith is about who we are and uh, about uh, our friends and our communities and, and can be a little more organic than that. And I don't mean you can purchase it at Whole Foods. Uh, that's not what I mean by organic. I mean we can uh, start to assess who, who are we and um, how do we relate to our community. And I know our passage this morning in Matthew 8 of Jesus and the centurion on the surface is not a uh, evangelistic type passage, and, and that's okay. Uh, there are plenty of evangelistic type passages, Paul and Acts, but I think uh, this passage speaks to us a lot about faith. 
And I think there are several things that Jesus does in this passage uh, that I hope uh, can help us think about how to share our faith. Um, And I want to highlight for you four things. I know good preachers give you three. Um, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm learning to be a good preacher, and I don't preach that often, so I thought I might slide in a fourth. Uh, So four things I think we can glean from this passage uh, about uh, sharing our faith and discussing faith and talking about faith uh, with our communities and with others. And the first one is that God is clearly already at work in the centurion's life. I think sometimes sharing our faith, we feel like uh, the, the old... Horatio Alger, we're world on our shoulders, we've got to do all this. But it is pretty clear that the centurion has to have some faith to even come to Jesus in the first part, right? Uh, The centurion believes Jesus can be of help. And I think we can take courage here that God is with us and God is working in ways we don't even understand. We don't know who told the centurion about Jesus. Maybe it was a neighbor. Maybe it was another soldier in the Roman army. Perhaps just the news of Jesus had gotten around. Here's this guy. He's out healing people, saying crazy things like heal or love your enemies. Right? Word gets out. We don't know how it is the centurion comes to know about Jesus, but it takes a little faith to even go and ask, right? That is what becoming a Christian is about. Lord, I can't do this on my own. And here is this centurion with great power in the Roman army who says, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I don't know how to heal my servant. I don't know what to do in this situation. God is already at work here. So, As we go, as we talk about faith, know God is with us. God is doing things we don't even get. And we can take courage in that. The second thing I think we can take from this passage, and Miss Susan said it so eloquently with our children, is that Jesus is willing to listen to those who are not like him. Sometimes even if we don't say it out loud, maybe we have in our mind the kind of people we think would fit in our congregation or the kind of people we think are ready to receive the message. The centurion was a symbol really as an enemy for the Jewish culture. The occupying army. He would not have been looked upon as a great hero by most of Jesus' listeners. In fact, many believed that when the Messiah came, that the Messiah would defeat the occupying army and finally put Israel on top. And Jesus, like he does so many times, flips the script. Not only does he listen and talk to the centurion, by the end of the passage... The centurion's the hero of the story, right? I wish more people would have faith like this. And I think it's hard for us to grasp what a slap in the face this may have been for many of Jesus' listeners. You mean not only is he the enemy, our political enemy, a symbol of an occupying army, he's also the hero of the story? We're supposed to have faith like him? And Jesus takes it a step further when he says, do I need to come to your house to heal your servant? It is a chance for the centurion to say, no, I have the faith, I I get it. I get what it is to be in charge. You don't have to come to my house. It is also a phrase that would have been shocking. You mean a good Jewish Rabbi, teacher, Jesus would go and risk being unclean to go into a Gentile's house? Another slap in the face. How could you even consider 
going to his house, Jesus? How could you consider listening to him? And then how in the world could you consider saying that this is the faith we all need to have? Jesus is willing to listen to those who are not like him. He's willing to welcome those who might even appear to be enemies. The third thing I think we can take from Jesus' relationship here with the centurion is that Jesus addresses the need. And having been a child teenager in the 1990s, um, at that time we might have said, duh, right? Jesus addresses the need. That's what Jesus does. But on the surface, um, it may seem like, yeah, of course he does. Um, but I, I think we need to not gloss over this. And I want to confess to you, uh, in this story that I'm about to tell you, I have no idea why I remember it. It is a story from my childhood that for some reason is imprinted upon my brain, and it's not even a watershed moment in my life, but I remember it well. I remember gathering together at my grandparents' house, probably for a birthday. I was seven, eight, nine years old. Uh, my aunt and uncle were there, my parents there. And as happens sometimes, um, as we were sitting around e eating the meal, uh, you've probably had a moment sometime in your life where um, you know something goes down the wrong way and you begin to cough or choke or gag. And I had a drink of water, and I began coughing uncontrollably. Uh, luckily for those at the table, the water did make it down the hatch before I <laughs> spit it all over everyone, and began coughing and coughing and coughing and, and just couldn't stop. And my grandmother, who I have no doubt loved me dearly, prayed for me every day, spoiled me to death, in my moment of uncontrollable coughing after having a drink of water, turned to me and said, Honey, why don't you take a drink of water? And my eight-year-old overly analytical brain said to itself, not out loud, that's what got me in this situation, right? I took a drink of water, that's why I'm here. And I understand, common knowledge, you have two options. The Heimlich, take a drink of water. That's what we tell people to do. I tell you that story to say sometimes as Christians, I think that's what we do, and not even as Christians, sometimes as people, that's what we do. We give people what they, we think they need. I think you need this. Here, have this. And I know my grandmother thought, you need a drink of water. That's not what I needed at that moment. I wish I hadn't taken a drink of water. Sometimes we give people what we think they need instead of what they really need. I know that's a dangerous thing to say because sometimes we do know exactly what people need. Some of you heard Micah crying a moment ago. There are times that Micah is crying and I know he needs to go to sleep. Does he want to go to sleep? No, of course he doesn't want to go to sleep. But he needs some sleep. But Jesus could have said all kinds of things when the centurion asked for help and asked for healing. And I think we can learn a lot about what Jesus didn't say. He doesn't say, you know what, I have 12 disciples. I would love a 13th disciple. Tell you what, if you become my 13th disciple, I will gladly heal your servant. He doesn't say, I, you know, I haven't seen you at synagogue recently. If you will just come to synagogue once a week, I will heal your servant. You know, can I interest you in a three to four hour speech about a heaven timeshare? And you can, uh, if you will sit through the timeshare, I will gladly heal your servant. There are all kinds of things Jesus could have said. But he sees the centurion's faith and he addresses the need. I am proud to say uh, that I'm a part of a church that spends a lot of time addressing needs. Some of you may have seen 
uh, Leslie's email uh, just a few hours ago about uh, needing things for our blessings box. We don't ask people to sign anything, fill out how often they've taken something from the blessings box. We know that is a need. And many times we have no idea whose needs we're addressing. For years, our deacons have had a benevolence fund that helps address needs in the community and needs in our church. Maybe it's an lg and &E bill. Maybe it is uh, help with rent. Maybe it's someone who needs help on a rainy day. Whether you know it or not, um, AARP is meeting here a couple of times a week to help people with taxes. And Daryl Elster and Randy Minnick have been very helpful in getting them acclimated and setting up, and I know many others have helped as well. Addressing needs is sharing faith. We may not always know who we're sharing faith with, whose needs we're addressing, but it is sharing faith. Jesus could have had a lot more to say, but Jesus knew that in addressing the centurion's need, ultimately someone else's need, he was showing the power of God and sharing faith. And what better opportunity, right, to give reason? Why is it? Your church does that. Why do they put food out there without asking who gets it and how much they take? Because it's what we believe Jesus would do. That's why. Because addressing needs is what Jesus would do. The fourth and final thing we can take from this passage is that the centurion can see that his faith in Jesus is worthwhile. We don't get to the end of the passage and find out that the centurion has asked for his servant's healing and Jesus says, yeah, maybe I'll think about it. Or good luck. We know by the end of the passage that it worked. That faith in Jesus works. Stumbled across an article uh, a couple of months ago as Susan and Dr. Cobbin and I began meeting about how it is we, we share our faith. Uh, and the title was, Millennials Are Leaving the Church and Not Coming Back. Uh, what really grabbed me about it was that it was done by a, a secular research organization, not uh, anyone who had, you know, been asked to do research for the church, but that this organization had noticed this on their own. It's an organization that does all kinds of statistics, uh, whether it be for elections or ball games, and they had noticed and felt the need to write an article about it. The common thought over the years has been, well, people grow up, they go to college, then they get married, have a family, and they come back to church. And in fact, this research article was saying that's not been the trend lately. Some of you may remember, like I do, in my early childhood, a time where on Sunday morning there was little to do other than stay home and go to church. Those were the options. There are plenty of options out there now. As we sit here, we could go to any restaurant, any store, sports games, ball games. There's all kinds of things to do. And I believe many in our culture, and especially our young people, want to know what makes this different? What makes this worthwhile? And that's a dangerous line to walk, right? Jesus is not a genie. Jesus is not a, hey, uh, just come in, ask me whatever you want, and you'll get what, exactly what you ask for. That's not the message of this passage. But the centurion figures out by the end, faith in Jesus is real. Our world is craving for something real, something life-changing, and something revolutionary. In the late 40s and early 50s, a pastor from Atlanta, Georgia, dared 
to put Jesus' words about loving your enemies into practice. And soon, from a Birmingham jail to lunch counter sit-ins to freedom rides on Greyhound buses, marches from Selma and Birmingham, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and so many others figured out Jesus' words really work. When put into practice, faith in Jesus Christ is life-changing and revolutionary. And our country was changed because Jesus' words are life-changing and revolutionary. I believe many of our young people and many people that did not grow up in church want to know, is it real? Does it really work? Is it worth my time? I have no doubt as I look out in the congregation, I know so many of your stories and I know Jesus is real to you. You would not be here. You didn't come here because you were bored. You didn't come here because you didn't have anywhere else to go. You came here because Jesus has changed your life. And I hope as we close this morning, as we talk about sharing our faith, I hope that's the exact message you share with friends and family and those you know. And we do all, all of us don't share in the same way. I don't share my faith the same way that Susan does, same way that Tony does same way that Micah will, I hope. But I hope as we close today, you are encouraged. Only you have your faith story. There's no one else like you in this room. Only you can share your faith the way you can share your faith. And I hope you're encouraged to share it and I hope you're encouraged as we leave today to know God is empowering you and alongside you to share your faith and what you know in the real Jesus Christ and the real faith you have experienced. Let's pray together. Holy God, sometimes sharing our faith can be scary and confusing, hard. Sometimes we don't even know where to start. But God, I ask, and we ask you that you will help us be ourselves, that you will help us share our stories of faith with our neighbors, uh, with our friends because we love them and care for them and that we know and have experienced what life-changing faith in Jesus Christ really is. In your name, amen. As we close today, if you are here and you have not experienced what it is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, this aisle is always open. And love to speak with you, whether it be me or Miss Susan, someone else on staff, even if you just have questions and say, what is this faith you're talking about? We would love to talk with you. Uh, these steps are always open if you uh, need time to pray, and we have plenty of, of members, deacons, and others who would be glad to pray with you uh, if you need prayer. Uh, and if you have been searching uh, for a church home. We would always uh, love to have you. Perhaps you've uh, made another church your home over the years and haven't been in church in a while or looking around. Uh, you are always welcome. Uh, come as we sing.